Uh, I'm going to speak to you today about the language of lines, how to design and use tactile graphics. Um, and this is a presentation that is much condensed and uh, cut down from a much longer presentation, so I just wanted to give a special thanks to my, uh, my co-workers who helped pr produce this presentation. Uh, Greg Corrette, Frank Welty from the Lighthouse for the Blind, Jerry Coons and Teresa Pastello, Ting Su from the San Francisco State University, and Lucia Hasty from tactilegraphics.org. Touch begins at birth. Oh, excuse me, that's very loud. Uh, and therefore, tactile learning begins at birth. And this happens whether you are sighted, blind, visually impaired. It doesn't matter. Everyone touches. This happens when a small child is crawling around on the ground, touching a face, touching a hand, picking up objects to explore them. This is what gets it all started. Uh, however, we unfortunately live in a don't touch world. How many times have you been to a museum or a store or an art gallery and seen a sign that said don't touch or had someone who was sort of guarding the artwork and said don't touch. We see this all the time. In fact, in the Mad Lab, uh, Media and Accessible Design Laboratory where I work, we have a gallery of tactile graphics that we've created up on the wall and we have to physically invite people to touch the tactile graphics because they stand there hesitant, staring at them, looking at them very closely. You can tell they want to touch them, but they won't do it without being invited because they're not sure they're allowed to. Uh, the thing is that tactile learning happens in the same part of your brain as visual learning. So it can be a replacement process, but it also happens at the same time. So even if you are sighted or if you have a visual impairment, you should be touching things too. We all need to touch things. And this is partly because no matter how good our vocabulary is, we have a hard time describing things such as something as complex as a map. In the opening session yesterday, we all experienced the difficulties with, okay, well, if you turn the map sort of upside down, and now if you look to your left, well, no, now it's your right. Um, that sort of confusion can happen easily, and that's why we need to get lines underneath our hands. We also need to work from real-world objects to abstract concepts. A drawing of a duck doesn't look like a duck. At least a tactile drawing of a duck doesn't look like a duck. It doesn't feel like a duck. Uh, in a session for the Van Gogh Museum earlier, we heard about how um, sunflowers don't feel like the paintings of sunflowers. What we need to do is work with what is there in the real world. So this slide shows on the right-hand side uh, an actual platform in a transit station in Calgary, Canada, and on the left-hand side, a map of that same station. An effective way to introduce kids to tactile graphics is to take something that they're very familiar with, say their bedroom, and show them a map of their bedroom. Show them here is the door, here is the bed, here is the closet, here is the dresser. And students begin to understand and relate that drawing to the actual thing and begin to understand the symbols used in the map and understand how that relates to the physical environment. As with reading and writing, the ability to analyze tactile graphics is a very complex cognitive skill. It takes time to develop. You can't just hand someone a tactile graphic and expect them to get it right away. Uh, it takes time to develop. We discovered this when we made tactile maps of the BART system, which is the Bay Area Rapid Transit System in San Francisco area. And we did these beautiful maps of all of the stations, and we distributed them far and wide. And we had people come back to us, and they said, you know, these maps are great, they're beautiful, they're lovely, but what do we do with them? <laughs> we discovered that 
people had not been trained to use tactile maps and that they were being handed a piece of tactile information that they didn't know how to make heads or tails of. So we started to develop material, training materials that helped guide people through the process everywhere from learning simple identification of shapes, square, circle, triangle, oval, all the way up to more complex concepts such as this is an escalator and it's going towards you or it's going away from you. So a lot of kids are getting tactile graphics for assessments, for quizzes, for tests, for standardized tests. But this is often the first time that they're seeing tactile graphics and just like those people who thought our BART maps were beautiful but kind of useless, these kids are being set up for failure because now you're not analyzing are these students answering the question correctly, you're analyzing can they figure out how to explore, understand, and interpret a tactile graphic. So we really need to get the tactile graphics into kids' hands early before they're needed for an assessment. As early as we can, we need to be getting these uh, tactile graphics into kids' hands at the same time as their sighted peers. So just as their sighted peers are getting information visually, the blind or visually impaired students need to be getting information tactilely so that by the time they reach an assessment they already know how to gain information from a tactile graphic and you can actually assess do they know the answer to the question not do they even know what the question is. And to speak about how to read and understand a tactile graphic I'm going to play a short video um, from one of my colleagues explaining how he, as a blind person, interacts with a tactile graphic. If I can get it to play. Okay, it's playing, but I'm not getting any sound. Um, okay, so I'm going to stand in for the sound for Frank. This is Frank. He's my colleague at the Lighthouse for the Blind and he is exploring a map of a 16th Street BART station, the street level. And the first thing he's going to do is sort of get an overview of the map and he's going to look at the key uh, if there is one. So he's exploring the symbols that he finds on the map. <laughs> Thank you. And he's finding staircases, escalators, bus stops, etc. Like the uh, like there we go. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Frank Welty, and I'm an alternate media specialist with the Mad Lab at the Lighthouse. I'm going to show you how I, as a blind person, interact with a tactile map or other tactile graphic. I have here in front of me a tactile map of the 16th Street BART transit station in San Francisco. So the first thing I do when I'm looking at a tactile map is I just do a quick overview with my hand to see how it's laid out. And I see that, yes, it's a map there. I can see it's some streets here. And then I look over at the key for the map, if there's one, to get familiarized with the different symbols that I might encounter or abbreviations on the map. And I here see that there's a stairway and some escalators and some other symbols. And then after I've reviewed the symbols, I go back to the map and look at more details. So like I stop, start at the top and I explore, working my way down. I see that there's a street named Mission and I can see that there's a street there. I find a, uh, an elevator. I find a bus stop symbol. I see a stairway and an escalator symbol and I continue on down. If I come to a symbol that I don't recognize, I'll keep one hand on that symbol to keep my place. And then I'll reach over to the key, find the matching symbol, and then I realize, aha, that's what I'm looking at. It's a down escalator. And that's how I can use the key and the map together to better understand the map. Now here's another example I have, and that is a pie chart, and I use a similar approach. This time I look at it very quickly, see it's a round circle, that's a pie chart, and then I look to see if there's a key and see what the different abbreviations and things on the chart would mean. And then I can go back to the chart and look at it in detail. Like I see that there's a very big section of the chart that's a major portion of this particular information on the chart work my way around in a circle along the chart, and I see a, the next largest segment, and so, and so forth. And so I have a very systematic approach to 
evaluating a tactile graphic. First, in uh, overview, check the key, and then look at the details. Okay, so that was Frank, and uh, one of the stories that Frank always tells is that back in the 1950s there were some studies that showed that tactile graphics weren't beneficial or useful for blind people. Um, it came out later that, as Frank always puts it, the tactile graphics they were using were just plain crummy. And so what the studies should have concluded was that blind people don't benefit from bad tactile graphics. However, we know now that they can greatly benefit from well-designed tactile graphics. There are a few things to keep in mind, though, as you are designing your tactile graphics. The, one is that the sense of touch is a lower resolution than visual acuity. You can't pick up as much detail with your fingers as you can with your eyes. Uh, for instance, Braille is about the equivalent of a 29-point font, whereas your typical print size is about 12 points. So that's almost three times bigger. Um, you have to simplify. You have to attenuate all of the information because you have so much more, that, or so much less, excuse me, that you can fit on a page. For all but the most simple drawings, you can't just raise the lines of a visual image and expect it to make sense. It'll be too cluttered, and clutter is the enemy of a good tactile. And the slide is showing a picture of an eye and a picture of a hand with a finger pointing. This next slide shows uh, texture distinction versus color distinction. It's the same image on both sides of the slide. One is, uh, uh, they're both charts. One is showing distinctions based on a texture. One is showing distinctions based on color. But tactile sense doesn't have the same level of discrimination as color sense. So if you're using textures to represent colors, they need to be very different, and you need to limit them to just a few. Three or four is ideal to avoid cognitive overload. If you have you know, 17 different textures on your map, you're going to start to say, OK, was that the texture for bathroom or no access? I can't remember. So you really need to make sure that you're limiting yourself to just a few simple textures that are very different from one another. The operative word here you'll hear me say over and over again is simplify, simplify, simplify. Before you make a tactile graphic, you should decide if you should make the tactile graphic. This is a great flowchart that is from the, uh, excuse me, the Braille Authority of North America Guidelines and Standards for Tactile Graphics. Not everything that appears as a graphic is necessary to repeat as a tactile graphic. If the image is a repeat of the text, is more meaningful in text form, or requires the use of visual discrimination or perception, then perhaps you shouldn't produce a tactile graphic. However, if the actual object is too small or too large, too detailed or too dangerous to have, you should produce a tactile graphic. Also, if you have information from the graphic needed to participate in discussion, complete tasks, or answer questions, then you definitely need to produce a tactile graphic. There are a number of ways to make tactile graphics, which I'm not going to go into in great detail because of uh, lack of time. But there's a couple of examples here. And at the top of the page, I'm showing two examples of thermoform. To the top left is a star chart. And to the top right is a beautiful color topographic map of San Francisco. In the bottom two are hand drawing tools. So there's the blackboard, and the ta um, that is on the left, and the tactile view tactipad is on the right. And both of these allow people to draw freehand or trace and produce graphics um, on the fly. There's also swell paper on the left, and graphics embossers on the right. Our shop primarily uses a graphic embosser such as the one shown, well, the one that produces what is shown on the right that 
produces large print, high contrast ink images as well as the tactile graphics so that everyone, no matter what their level of sight is, can use the same graphic. These are only a few of the tools that someone can use. Um, and I have some resources in a handout that I will pass around. There are braille copies, so if you need a braille copy, please take one. If not, please uh, keep passing the braille copies on so that they're there for those who need them. The skills you need are good design, knowledge of blindness and low vision, and I say that not just, okay, I know a blind person, but you need to know how they are going to interact with not only a tactile graphic and how they're going to explore it, but also how they're going to explore and interact with the world. Uh, and you need, again, the ability to simplify and distill the essence of the graphic in order to render the best tactile graphic possible. The good versus bad design, good is going to be simple, clear, uncluttered, shows the most important elements, and has correct labeling. Bad is going to be busy, complex, show elements that are unimportant, and have poor or missing labeling. When I first started making tactile graphics, I had Frank, uh, who you saw in the video, exploring a map that I had made to proof it in-house for us. And he came to a section that he didn't understand, and he said, what is this area that I'm feeling here, this raised texture? And I said, well, that's the grassy area, that's the quad of the campus. And he said, well, how am I supposed to know that? I said, because it's green. And then I thought, oh my god, I just said that to a blind person, I feel so embarrassed. Um, and immediately took the map back from him and went and added to the key a, a swatch of that texture and labeled it grass quad area so that we no longer had that confusion. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say you need to make sure that you're labeling things properly and that you're not expecting that certain conventions that apply to visual uh, design are going to apply to tactile design. Um, and I'm going to skip this video for time, but I want to leave you with top 10 things to know about tactile graphics. And that is that developmentally, touch begins at birth, whether sighted, visually impaired, or blind. Number two is tactile graphics are vital to inclusion in education, employment, transit, and many other areas. Number three is that to interpret and understand a tactile graphic, the reader must have some experience with the object or concept being pictured. Four is to build on students' own experiential knowledge and cr concrete understanding. Five, the key word of tactile graphics, I said it before and I'll say it again, it's simplify, simplify, simplify. There is, number six, is there's more to making a tactile graphic than raising lines and adding braille labels. Seven is not everything that appears as a, tact or as a visual graphic needs to be a tactile graphic. Eight is that reading and understanding tactile graphics is not as easy as it may look, and we should do everything we can to make it easier. Nine is that with good tactile graphics, great results are possible. And 10, there are resources available. You don't have to do this alone. So the handouts that I p was passing around include some of those resources and include these top 10 things to know about tactile graphics. So uh, hopefully you now know more about tactile graphics than you did when you started. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, BJ, for this uh, facts about tactile graphics and the importance of learning to read tactile graphics and do it from the early age. And the 10 points that you pointed out at last is so important to think about. Questions from the audience? There, Mark. Thank you very much. There was a lot uh, to, to, to digest um, <laughs> that we have. But I was interested in the video showing Frank studying the map. 
And uh, what I found interesting was that he started at the top of the page, or the far edge of the page, going down. But when you come to an intersection, you have to imagine yourself, your mirror image of yourself, you go down, and then when you turn left, you actually, your hands move right. I don't know what I mean. If you come down the page, you come to an intersection, and you want to turn left, then your hands actually move to the right because you have to imagine yourself that you're coming towards yourself. Was that Frank's choice to study the map like that, or was it part of the, I don't know, the, maybe the, the instructions that, that he received? <laughs> um, so Frank began at the top of that map because that was where the label describing what the map was, uh, was located. So um, those particular maps have a north arrow pointing which direction is north, so you can reorient the map as you decide. He just started at the top because that was where the label was. Okay, thank you very much, PJ. And uh, now...